Good morning. 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 Good morning. Okay. So since you're here, you got the new invite and you got the sheets for to finish up section 7.2 and start on 7.3. So um, what I plan to do about the quiz, some of you I noticed on that very first question didn't give the answer in the correct form. You had the letters, but you forgot to use your set notation. So I'll go back in and put, add a point onto your score. Okay. Everybody okay with that? Question on that. I also plan to go over some of the questions that you missed and post that on YouTube. And I'll let you know as soon as that's done. Okay. All right. So we're talking about empirical probability of tossing a head. Now we have two types of probability. So our two types of probability are experimental or empirical. Experimental means that Jordan is sitting there tossing a coin and recording whether she gets a head or a tail. And maybe she does this for 10 times. Empirical says that if she does this enough times, this is the probability she should wind up with for heads if it's a fair coin. So experimental means that you're doing something and you're recording the results. Empirical means that the results should be tending towards this particular probability. Question on the difference between experimental and empirical. All right, so we're going to look at what happens when we toss a coin. So use the notation for probability. So we're looking at the probability of getting ahead. Now, recall that we said that a probability was a function. So in other words, the event is the input and the output is the probability or the how likely is that to occur. So Jordan, what is the probability of getting ahead? Uh, would it just be one half? Yes, it is. Now, when you're giving your answers in WebAssign, Pay attention to what they're asking for. Sometimes they'll tell you that they want it as a decimal and they'll tell you how many decimal places to use. Okay. And the next question is, what is the probability that the coin will land tail side up? Stephen, what's the probability of a tail? One half. What is the probability that the coin will land with head side and tail side up at the same time, Jim? I would say zero. You would be nope. correct. Okay, because remember, H intersect T, there's nothing in common between those two. So that means the probability of those two is zero. Okay. And last of all, what is the probability that the coin will land? So that means head or tail. So Delaney. What's the probability of head or tail? Would it be one since yes. you're adding both halves? 
Yes, exactly. That's the certain event. Head and tail is the impossible event. Question on that. All right, next up, we're looking at important rules. Each event has a probability between zero and one. So for example, here what we're saying is zero is less than or equal to the probability of a head is less than or equal to one. The probability of getting a tail is also between zero and one. Next up, we have that when the, we have two possible outcomes, when we add those together, the probabilities of those two outcomes should add up to one. Now, we already said that. Another way of saying that is that the probability of heads or tails is equal to one. The probability of heads or tails is equal to the probability of heads plus, plus the probability of tails. Okay, so sometimes you're asked to create a probability distribution table. So when you're asked to do that, the table looks like So you'll notice that we have the simple event and associated with each of the simple events is a probability. Now, a simple event is, so when we talked about sample space, we had outcomes and we called those sample points. A simple event is one of the sample points. So when we talk about a simple event, we're talking about, for example, with tossing a coin, we get a head or we get a tail. So the simple event is a subset of the sample space so the probability associated with Getting a head is one half, a tail is one half, and our total is one. So that's just putting the information that we have over here all into a table. Question on that before we go on. Now, if you're asked, one of your homework problems asks to list all of the events. So when you're asked, to list all of the events, then you're going to list all of the possibilities. If they just ask you to list the simple events, then you have these single sample points, okay? So remember, we have some where we looked at a sample space and then we combined outcomes. If they're asking for the simple events, it would just be these two sets that would be listed. All right, so let's talk about if we, just along those lines, if we were drawing cards and we were talking about drawing a heart, a diamond, a club, a spade, our simple events 
would just be H in our braces, our C in our braces, our S in our braces, and our H in our braces. Does that make sense to everybody for simple event? Question on that before we go on. Okay, so every non-empty event of the experiment may be obtained by taking a finite union of some of the simple events. A uniform sample space. So what we're seeing here is a uniform sample space. We had two outcomes. Each of them are equally likely. Now, if I had a weighted coin, so for example, that heads would come up more frequently, then it would not be a uniform sample space. So uniform sample space, tossing a coin, getting heads or tails. Rolling a die, just one die, you have a uniform sample space. Rolling two dice and your outcomes being the sum of the faces, what about that? Is that going to be a uniform sample space? So in other words, let's briefly visit rolling a pair of dice. We'll do that in just a little bit, but let's talk about if that's whether or not that is a uniform sample space. So we're gonna roll a pair of dice And our sample space consists of the numbers starting with two. Ethan, what's our largest sum for a pair of dice? It's six. <clears throat> pair of dice. Oh, 12. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. Are these equally likely? So, Hannah. What about a two and a seven? Do we get a two and a seven same number of times when we roll a pair of dice? No. So the answer here is no. If we roll a single die, then our outcomes, Ethan, you were right. If we looked at a single die, it would be one through six and the probability of each of those, as long as it's a fair die, is one six. Everybody okay with what equally likely means? Question on that before we go on. Okay, so you'll notice that they go ahead and on the worksheet, you have that simple events will occur with one over n. So we just talked about the probability with, when I roll a die, each of the numbers has a probability associated with it of one sixth. So our sample space consists of sample points. The sample events, the simple events for our sample space are just those single sample points. And then the properties of probabilities, once again, we have that probability 
Now, we're not going to look at probability as a percent. We're always going to write it as either a fraction or a decimal between 0 and 1. And if we add up all of the probabilities, so even though this is not a uniform sample space, if we add up the probability of getting a 2, the probability of getting a 3, the probability of getting a 4, all the way up to the probability of getting a 12, when we add those all together, we're going to get 1. And last off, when we look at the probability of the union of two of our events, if they're simple events, then we're going to just add the probabilities of each of those simple events. Okay, so we need to be a little bit careful uh, when we look at our events. If we have the empty set, which is what Jim told us about. So the probability of the empty set is always going to be zero. Okay, so we now have a table. The blood types of 1,500 people are shown in the table, and you're asked to find probabilities. So let's go ahead and do that. So you're asked for the, what is the probability that a person selected at random has blood type A? Well, first of all, remember from Friday that the first thing we do is we put the total number in the denominator. So we have 1,500 in the denominator. And in the numerator, Julius, what are we going to put for type A? Uh, is it four? Uh, no. If you look at your table, you'll see that the number of individuals out of those 1,500 that have type A is 615. So we're going to put that 615 in the numerator. Okay. Question on that. Then we're asked, what is the probability that a person selected at random has type A or type O blood? So type A or, remember or is union, type O. And before we go any further, why don't you drag out your calculators and we'll put the decimal representation of the probability of type A. Jake, what's the probability of type A as a decimal? Uh, I got 0.41. Okay. So we have 0.41. Now we're going to look at, this says, according to our rule, since these are simple events, union means we're going to add these together. So we already know the probability of A is 0.41. Let's go ahead and calculate the probability of O, where we know that there are 660 
of the 1,500 that have type O. Jordan, did you come up with a decimal for the probability of type O? No, I don't think I'm looking at the right worksheet. I don't have the numbers. Okay. So it, at the top, it says simple events and uniform sample space. Okay. I have that, but okay. And it's example one. Okay, I'm on the wrong one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Let's go to someone else while Jordan gets to the right one. Let's see. Um, Zach, what'd you come up with for the probability of O? Um, I just did 660 out of 1500. I didn't simplify it. But then okay. when you Let's add them ahead. together. Okay. Um, you can do that. Or you, let's go ahead and, and write down the decimal representation of that 660 over 1,500. Uh, 0.44. Okay. And so, Zach, you would have gotten the same thing if you did this first and then added them together. Yep. Or you did it your way. So you can do it either way, OK? Jordan, are we good now? Yes, I got it. Thank you. Okay. All right. So we're now going to go to the second sheet that I sent out to you, which says rules of probability. So when we're talking about rules of probability, the first rule says that the probability of an event has to be greater than or equal to zero. So we have, if E is any event, our first rule is that the probability of E has to be greater than or equal to zero. The probability for the entire sample space is equal to one. So if we add up all the probabilities of the outcomes in the sample space, we'll get one. If E and F are mutually exclusive, So F is another event. Denon, what does mutually exclusive mean? Mm -hmm. 
that are we, are we on E and F or mutual? So that, <clears throat> if what I'm reading here is uh, it's that <clears throat> you would add E and F together. Right. Wait, and so the reason you can do that is because they're mutually exclusive, which means their intersection has nothing in common. Okay. So the mutually exclusive is the really important part. That says that, for example, the event is a heart or a spade. Those have nothing in common. If we said a heart or a queen, those are not mutually exclusive because they share the queen of hearts. Okay? So mutually exclusive means that if you intersect these two sets, the intersection is empty. Okay. All right, so we can add these when we say E or F, we can simply add those probabilities together. A more general rule is just like the number of elements in the union is equal to the number of elements in the first set plus the number of elements in the second set minus the number of elements in the intersection. So the same thing is true with probabilities. If you take the probability of the union E or F, it's equal to the probability of E plus the probability of F minus the probability of the intersection. Now, rule three is just the special case because we said that if they're mutually exclusive, that means that this intersection is the empty set. And remember, the probability of the empty set is zero. And last but not least in the rules, we have about the complement. So the probability of the complement of a set is equal to one minus the probability of the original set. So an example of this is So your experiment is tossing a coin six times. So we're going to toss a coin six times. If you recall, That means that we have six spots with a possibility of two outcomes in each, and we're going to multiply those together. So if we raise two to the sixth, that's the same as eight times eight, better known as 64. So first of all, 
E, do you want to write down the sample space for this particular experiment? No. No. <laughs> And it says at least one head, and we'd be looking for all the outcomes that have at least one head. So we'd have to, first of all, list all of the outcomes, which are 64, and then we'd have to count up all the ones that have at least one head. Well, what we can do instead is look at, notice we could switch these places. So the probability of an event is equal to one minus the probability of the complement of the event. So what is the complement of at least one? It's no heads. So I either have at least one head or I have no heads. So the probability of no H. So everybody see how those are complements of each other, at least one or no heads. Now, what's the only way that I can get no heads? Let's see. Ethan, what's the only way I can get no heads? Uh, if you flip tails twice? All six times I have to flip a tail in order to get no heads. So that means that the probability of no head is 1 over 64. So I would have been counting for a long time if I were looking for at least one head. So it's 1 minus 1 64th or 63 over 64 is the probability of getting at least one head. So we use this last rule either in its present form or if we switch sides of the complement and the original event, that will also be the same rule. So in other words, if I'm looking at a certain event, and the probability of the complement is easier to come by, I will do that first. So statement five can be restated as the probability of an event. So I'm just adding that to both sides and then subtracting off the probability of the complement. Question on that. Okay, so I'm go go ahead and um, do a screen share. All of you should have in front of you example one, a pair of dice is rolled, and the numbers that appear uppermost on each die is observed. Find the probability of each of the given events. Now remember, if we're talking a pair of dice, each have the outcome of six, so the number of elements in our sample space, it's 36. Okay. So we're looking at 36 outcomes. <clears throat> Everybody see the dice? Are we good? So the first question is asking us the sum of the numbers is even. Okay. 
So I know that I'm going to have 36 in my denominator because that's the total number of elements in my sample space. Jacob, how many of those outcomes are even? Eighteen. Okay. Question on that. Okay, our next question is a pair of ones are thrown. Marcus, how many out of the 36 outcomes are a pair of ones? Uh, one out of 36. Okay. One die shows a six and the other is a number less than three. So we have a six, it doesn't matter which die has the six, but the other number has to be less than three. Harley, how many of our outcomes, our sample points satisfy that? Harley, what do you Sorry, think? Sorry, I thought I unmuted myself. Okay. Um, I honestly don't know. Okay, so if you look in at the upper right-hand corner, you have see a six and a one and a six and a two. Those would satisfy. And then if you look at the lower left-hand corner, you have a one and a six and a two and a six. Those would both satisfy. So you have four out of the 36 that satisfy these two criteria. Okay. Does that make sense now, Harley? Yes. Yeah, so you're looking, you're looking for like a pair of dice that fall right. under that. One has a six and the other is less than three. And it doesn't okay. matter what order, it's just you're looking for one of them has to be a six and the other one has to be less than three. Okay? Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. And the sum of the number is not greater than 10. So we could do a bunch of counting, or we could use our last rule. So the probability of not greater 
than 10 is equal to one minus the probability of being greater than 10. So this is one minus, is it easier to see the ones that have a sum greater than 10? Jordan, what do you think? I'm not sure. So I just counted them and got four of 30, four of 36 too. Okay. So out of the 36, so not greater than 10, you would only exclude 11 and 12, right? So those are the ones that are greater than 10. So in other words, in this case, this is a much smaller number of outcomes to look at, to consider. So it would be 33 out of 36? Yes. Okay, that's, that's what I meant. I'm sorry. I, I said that's that. okay. So that's a much easier way that rather than, now with 36 outcomes, it's not so terrible. You can certainly count those up. But as you get larger sample spaces like the 64 we saw before, you should ask yourself, is the complement of the event you're asked to find the probability of easier to find than the probability of the original event. Okay, question on that. Okay, so let me take that down. And let me come back and see who may have joined us. Is Ashley here? Yes. Kayla? Matt? Yeah. Okay. Davion? Hunter? Riley, Ralph, and Stefan. Okay, so let's look at the next, which has to do with the deck of cards. So think about the cards that are in a deck of cards. We've been this over this a couple of times. All right, so if we're talking about a deck of cards, we want to know what the probability of a king of diamonds. So first of all, for all of these problems, Marcus, what are we going to put in the denominator for all of these questions? Could you uh, restate that? I wasn't uh, listening, sorry. Okay. <laughs> so we're looking at a deck of cards and we're looking at drawing a, a, car, a single card and we're looking at the probability of that particular event, what's the denominator going to be for all of these probabilities? 52. Okay. So the first event is drawing the king of diamonds.
Christina. How many ways can that event occur? One. Yes, exactly. Next, a face card. Denon. How many elements are in the event face card? 12. Any question on 12? So we have the probability of an ace not drawn. Jim, how would you do this? I would subtract the aces from the whole samples. Okay. So we can either do it as one minus or out of 52 using that last property that we talked about, or doing it your way of just saying that there are 48 cards, which either way, the result is the same. By doing it your way, you're really using our rule because 52 over 52, 52 minus four is exactly what you were saying to do. So you can either do it immediately or you can think about the rule five that we were talking about. Jim, does that make sense? It does, thank you. Okay. And a heart or a queen is drawn. Now, This is where we're going to use the addition property. So we have heart or queen. So that equals the probability of a heart plus the probability of a queen plus the probability of, excuse me, minus the probability of a heart intersect queen. So Hannah, how many hearts are there? 13. Okay. Ethan, how many queens are there? There's four. Austin, how many Queen of Hearts are there? One. So this was like when we were back in our Venn diagrams where we have to be careful about not double counting the queen of hearts because the queen of hearts is part of the probability for getting a heart and part of the probability of getting a queen. So we're gonna subtract that off. So that gives us how many out of 52, Zach? Sixteen. Okay. 
All right. Questions on what we did today? Okay, so we'll talk, we'll finish up the worksheet on rules of probability. We'll do the rest of the examples tomorrow. Okay. And I'll let you know tomorrow when that the YouTube with the quiz answers will be posted. Okay, have a great day. See you tomorrow. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Um, Ms. Nichols, Professor Nichols. Okay. Hey, I have a couple questions. Okay. Let me turn off the recording.